Coming up, Benjamin Boyce from Caught in the Act. Listen to this, Mum. I made it. <laughs> the manager was the, the enemy. We all got threatened to be kicked out at some point. They even threw ashtrays at us. There's a fan missing. Can we search your house? But to come back to your question, I would definitely, definitely say yes. Now, just time to remind you to subscribe to this channel. Helps me. And also, you'll be the first to hear when I post something new on the site. Well, he's an old friend of mine from his Cologne days. This is Benjamin Boyce. <laughs> Benjamin Boyce, first of all, welcome. It's great to see you again. Where are you? Great to see you too, Steve. Um, I'm in Florida. So moved here, um, let's see, January 2023. So here I am. <laughs> You're full of surprises. You're always full of surprises. I want to take you back to your childhood, first of all, and just ask you about your early life and what sort of music your parents played in the household and whether you were brought up in any form of a creative household. I was brought up with classical music. So both my parents, my mother was a pianist, my father was a cellist. So um, we didn't we didn't really hear much pop music around, you know, there was the furthest it went was West Side Story, you know, from the 60s with Natalie Woods, you know, that version. Um, you know, Maria, I just met a girl named Maria. You know that one? So that's that's basically as far as pop music went, which was considered to be pop music back in the 60s. Um, so, but then, you know, then came Music Box and MTV with you. So that's where I knew you from. And uh, that's how I actually really got introduced to music. So that was from the age from about, I don't know, I think it was about 12, 13, something like that. And... Before that, I, I did, I was into Blondie. I liked Blondie. So I did like quite like sort of a little bit of a wild sound of music. What did your uh, parents want from you though? Did they, did they envisage a very different type of life? Because when I think about my parents, and I think there's some similarities there. I mean, I'm, I'm from a family that broke up as well. And also my parents, they argued a lot and they didn't really value creativity. They always wanted or said things like, you know, you must get something secure with money. Right. Oh, God, yeah. Well, I had that. <laughs> and, of course, when I, uh, when I said I wanted to be an actor before I'd finished high school, which I didn't finish, um, they were a bit, you know, obviously... Actually, my father didn't really uh, get into it much. You know, he'd always look at the worrying side of things, but not actually the perspective of, like, okay, well maybe you should do this or maybe you should do that. Um, but my mother, of course, was very worried because I just came home one day and I said, I want to be an actor, so I'm going to quit school. So, you know, you can imagine <laughs> this teenage boy saying to his mum, you know, what, what kind of uh, arguments went on and discussions. Um, but I think that rolled into, I did go ahead and do it. And I went to all these agencies and I got into a part, you know, a couple of part-time films, just little bits and pieces here and there, and nothing you could call as, you know, being an actor. But it was a, it was a good start for somebody who didn't have an education in acting. And that it's through that same agency, that's actually how I got into my band, Courtney Act. Didn't you meet at high school? I don't think you were friends with them, but Eloy and Bastian were actually at the same high school, which is quite weird, but you weren't actually friends no, with them. No, no, actually, all that is, all that is, is BS. <laughs> oh, is it? That all was, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just something that the, because at the time you had take that, you had E17, you had all these boy bands popping up, and it was already being very criticised that, you know, auditioning was not such a great PR method. So we came up with this, all this, this, these stories about, you know, sort of knowing each other before. And I met Lee and, you know, this and that through friends. And I can't even remember the, uh, the, the lie story. <laughs> um, so, yeah, you know, and then, I mean, since then it has been revealed, you know, all of us have, have actually honestly said how, how it really was. And uh, I, thought, I thought it was actually quite interesting to finally be able to say at some point, you know, how it was to audition for a, a group like that, because that's a pretty amazing story as well. Um, because I went there, you know, from this agency, this 
guy who ran the agency, who got me also these small parts of films and commercials and stuff, he said, you really need something fixed, but it's not going to be a film because you haven't got a, a career as an actor. You haven't got a, a schooling. So um, he said, I'll come up with something. And he came up with this boy band uh, audition. And I went to it and I was really shit, I, you know, because I couldn't dance and, you know, I couldn't do any choreography. I could sing a little bit, but that's about it. And uh, so it was all about the look because I fit the profile of the role models that they were looking for. And uh, so he sent me to this audition and there were 750 people, you know, not on that day, but there were 750 people, you know, in, and I thought, I don't have a, I don't have a, a chance of this, forget it. You know, this is never going to work out. So I did the first audition and got through. And then I did the second audition and I failed because that was the one where we did the choreography and picking up. And then that one, there were about 10 leftovers from, you know, who was going to feature in this boy band, maybe. And so I failed that one. And then I, so I, so I got in touch with my, with my agent and I said, look, I can get this. I'll, I'll do it. You know, I can study. It'll take me more time than it will for somebody who has experience with choreography. But I can do this. So the manager who was running the whole show, he, uh, he was quite intrigued that I said that. So he said, all right, well, let's have him in again. And so I was eventually in the final pick. And, uh, you know, he just said, I have to work on it. And I did. And, you know, it was a, a lot of work. <laughs> but I managed to get it done. So tell me about in the audition, you said there were certain roles that had to be fulfilled for each of the guys, I suppose. What were they? Um, what, what do you mean, what roles? Like, Well, you know, like they have the idea of like a sunny boy, like the one who's a joker or that they have like, the, oh, yeah. you know, so, what, what, what one were you supposed to be? Well, that was the thing. We, when we, when we find, had the final and we'd all sign, he said, so we're going to have to figure out who's who, but we'll figure that out within time. And I think I was the, definitely the more sporty one, uh, adventurous, naughty and you know and cheeky i suppose i suppose that was the the sort of role so if you could put that in one word what would it be i suppose it would be the the rebel of the band i would probably say if you could call it that but you know in boy band terms it's very sort of disney i suppose i would have been that one <laughs> i actually read i read this book psychology book once about how when you're given certain names you live up to the name. So my real name is Stephen James, but I'm Steve Blaine. So I'm to blame for lots of things. And you sort of live up to that. Then if you're given a role, then maybe you're not the rebel when you go in there, but you live up to be the rebel later on. Do you think it, that would have had an impact? Oh, knowing absolutely. Absolutely. It was, you mean, so sort of in a, in a way, you're sort of wanting to be that part or... Yeah, you're developing into that as a person even, not just on stage yes. and in the band, but as a person. Yes. Yes, I definitely think that's the case. I mean, I was, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was sort of into people like James Dean, which was the rebel of his time. And, you know, that look and the whole uh, sort of ordeal around it. And that was definitely what I wanted to be. So I was happy when I actually got that role in, in the band as, all right, you're that guy, you know, that felt right to me. What what was the dream? Was the dream to be famous or did it have something to do with music? Because I always find the initial part with a boy band is quite difficult because everyone's young. So they're often, for want of a better word, they're often manipulated into right. doing what they don't necessarily want to do. So how comfortable were you at the beginning and how comfortable were the other guys? Well, we all had the same dream and we used to sort of, you know, make jokes about when we were in the, in the you know, while we were rehearsing, um, you know, we did a lot of sitting around and sort of dreaming about what it would be like, you know, if we had like, you know, thousands of people come into a concert or if we're in a dressing room and all these fans are banging on the door. So one of them demonstrated how that would be. And we were sitting in the room really sort of, it was almost like it, it tipped it off as magic because that actually happened. 
And I think because we were four guys and we all had the same dream of this, you know, this being famous, um, that it actually happened, you know. So, and I don't think it was so much about the music because we didn't really have any say about the music. We left that up to the management and we very much disagreed because he had a very old fashioned and he was very stubborn. He had a very old fashioned taste. So it took him about two years to really catch on what was in and what was out. Um, he was going for a very 80s thing. So this was already 10 years later, you know, this is in the 90s, a decade later. So, and it took him a while to get that. And also the look at the pictures and everything was very sort of 80s style, um, which is pretty cool now when you look back at it, but it was totally out of time, you know, um, time frame in, in the time when we were started. And it was just, you know, it was like this old grandpa who, you know, if you wear an earring, he says, well, what's that? You know, and, you know, you can't wear that. And, you know, so, and then you wouldn't ask him anymore. You just do stuff. So I got, you know, I got an earring and then I got another one. And it took him about six months to notice that I had two. So very funny. But he he, he did say to him, but well, don't do anything else without asking. You know, I, uh, I remember if you dyed your hair, you had to had to talk to him about. It. I dyed my hair bright uh, blonde, sort of the bright white color, and he said, "Oh, you you can't." He said, I said, "I'm sorry. It, it, it you know it turned out this way. I didn't want it to be like this. I was lying, of course, um, but just to get some kind of you know sympathy." And he said, um, Right, well, you've got to change it back. You know, you've got to at least make it, make it a little darker. So then I, I did it again with some brown, and then it went green. <laughs> so in the end, then he said, well, that's even worse than the way it was before. So can you get a, like a dye wash? So I went again to the hairdresser, and then I had this dye wash. And then it finally went back to, to this sort of bright color. So I got what I wanted in the end that way. So if you sort of go all the way around it. The cliche about a boy band is when they sign a contract, they're not really aware of mm. what's in the contract. What would you say about that and how young people can be dealt with in this music industry that can be sometimes really unfair for people when they're young and they're not really aware of what it might mean? Yeah, I mean, it is unfair and it's still going on and there's no rule against it. If you sign a contract with something in it that you did later disagree with, that's it. You know, it's very difficult to get out of. I mean, if you look at bands like Millie Vanilli, their contract with uh, whatever that, that producer's name was again. Frank you know, Farian, yeah. Frank Farian. You think, oh my God, this was just for a, a thousand marks a week or something or, or a month or 2,000 a month or something like that which later went up to uh, 2,500, you know, which was a bit more for back in those days, but still that's peanuts if you're a, you know, world famous singer, or at least pretending to be one <laughs> in their case. Um, so, okay, your question. Well, I think when we signed our contract, we did have it checked, but we didn't have enough money to have it properly checked. So obviously there were things in there that we, you know, couldn't really do it, do much about at the time because we didn't really know what everything meant anyway. Uh, lucky for us though, we didn't get much, much much on the royalties, but lucky for us, the 60-40 for the shows uh, was supposed to be 60 for the management and 40 divided between us, so each 10%. But he, he, he made a mistake in the contract. So it was 60% that went to us and 40% to him. So yeah, that's, uh, <laughs> that's what it said. So we ended up making a little bit more. So that was that was good. What about when you actually, okay, so you met the other guys at the, I presume you met them either at the audition or shortly afterwards. What did you make of each other? What did you make of them? Um, well, I met, let's see, I, the first audition, so there was a, a group actually that already existed, but that's a whole completely different story, which did wasn't called Courtney Act. Uh, where they'd been in and out. So it was like a test group, basically, for the management. And he wasn't happy with it. So from that test group, only one was left. And he'd already been doing this for, for, I think it was about two or three years. And that was Eloy, basically. Um, so he was left. He, he made a decision to keep him at first. Um, 
because later on he found out he was he was gay. So then it was like a question whether he should stay in the group or not. But we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so there was him first, basically. Me and Bastian did the same audition. So not I don't think it was on the same day, but we we did basically do the final thing together. So and then when, when we were picked, obviously, and then Lee came along later because he was auditioned through England through uh, Julie Forsyth. You remember Bruce Forsyth, right? Right. Well, one of his daughters is called Julie Forsyth, and she very very pretty uh, woman married to this guy. They were doing country music with the same management. So she did it through her sources and found Lee in, in a, you know, um, a music or a, uh, he went to acting school, acting college, and that's where they found Lee. So when we found Lee, I, th I, I mean, to be honest, I thought he was a bit of a drip when I first met him. I wasn't, because he was quite insecure. Um, you know, nice looking face. But once we got talking to him, actually, he, I mean, he turned out to be my best friend in the end, but that's the way it often is, isn't it? Um, so yeah, that's uh, that was that part. Well, let's not forget about Eloy. So we might as well go there now because right, when you, sure. when you say that, I mean it's a really interesting story because when I started with MTV, their problem with me was that I was gay, and they had a big right. meeting. Can I be gay on MTV? This was in 1987. This is right. a lot later. Well, um, at the time, we, I mean, when we all knew already quite soon that he was gay. I mean, this, this was already known to us after about two weeks, he told us. But he said, don't tell the manager. So we didn't. Uh, we kept it secret. And I think it was about, uh, it was, I think it was about a year later, because he was already living with this, with a boyfriend who was actually famous from a television show in Holland called Carlo Bossart, um, was his boyfriend at the time. And they were living together and everything. So, of course, the danger was that they would be seen together. And, of course, they were. And at a certain point, there was a, a sm not a, a huge thing, but there was a small column written about it. Because being gay in, in, in the Netherlands is not a big deal, even then. I mean, they, they've always been very liberal. I mean, like a step forward, I think, than the rest of the world uh, with a lot of things. And uh, so for everybody, it was sort of like a normal thing, except the manager. I mean, this is this tough guy you know, who was from Den Haag, which is a place in uh, in Holland, which is quite a rough place. So he's a real street kid who grew up. And um, so he, he he didn't really have the same um, opinion about this. So he had, a, he had, he, he, he we, we all got a call from, um, from him to cut, join him in his office. He needs to talk to us. So we were pretty sure what this was about. And he said, well, you know, he's gay and, uh, you know, he's got to be, he's, he's got to be, kicked out, we can't have a gay in the group, you know, what do you think? And we all said, well, you know, um, after a long speech she gave us, we all said, well, you know, we don't have to tell anyone if it's uh, if it's a big thing and no one has to know. So we'll just keep our mouths shut, shut about it and uh, he can play the role of the, uh, the nice little hetero boy, you know, for the girls. So, I mean, if you join a boy band these days, it might be different because, I mean, you've obviously got male fans as well. So why not? The more the merrier, right? That's the whole idea. Um, but I think for this group, uh, it was very, you know, the plan was very guided onto, onto, onto young girls. And so we all kept it secret. We all lived with it. And uh, I'm sure for him it was difficult at times. But were, you, were thought, you allowed to have girlfriends in public, the rest of you? No, not really. Um, he didn't want us to make it public. How did you deal with we it? Did, we did have girls. We just didn't talk about it. And the <laughs> thing is, the fans knew. And they said, well, why don't you say in public that you have a girlfriend? I said, because I'm not allowed to. It was as simple as that. I would just say, you know, my manager doesn't want me to talk about it. So, you know, and that was it. <laughs> so then I could be honest to them at the same time as um, having a girlfriend, you know. And, uh, you know, Bastien had a girlfriend and, well, Eloy had, a, had a, I think, another boyfriend by that time. So, and, and Lee actually had a girlfriend too at some point, uh, who actually later also declared that he was, uh, he was gay as well. So he actually had two gay, gay guys in the band. Um, so, but he didn't, he didn't come out with that until, ooh, I think it was about 2015 or 2016, yeah.
So, okay, so you've started in this in this group, and in a sense, because the management was difficult, the manager was difficult, I assume that, in a sense, that you were more cohesive, you were more together, um, because you're protecting each other. You know, you've already mentioned that you're protecting Eloy, so I'm sure Eloy was very grateful that he's in the band and and uh, in that atmosphere. And also you're looking, you're, you know, watching out for each other. So at the mm. start, was there some sort of cohesion and was there really a friendship there? What was it? I think it was just a mutual respect. We weren't always friends. I mean, I, I, it, I don't know, it sort of changed. We, we sort of hung out with that person for a while and then you'd hang out with that person. And I think that's how we found out who's my best friend here. Um, for me, it was definitely Lee. He was, he was English. We, you know, we often had the same opinion, not always, but we often had the same opinion about things. Um, and I think with Eloy, it was probably the least, but we did both have a very mutual respect for each other. And no matter what, if we had a bad day or a fight on that day, nobody would spill the beans on somebody else. So obviously, because, you know, you, you make a pact, sort of pact, and you don't break it. And because he was the enemy, basically, the manager was the, the enemy. Uh, so, you know, although I have to say, you know, I, I mean, people always complain the manager was this and that. But I mean, if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have got where I wanted to be either. So in that sense, I am thankful to him. I mean, you did say that the, the management already had like a test ban before with, with Eloy and that hadn't worked, which is why they were changing. Knowing that is a sense of insecurity, isn't it? Knowing that, oh, God, that one didn't work. If we don't work, we ain't going to be around that long either. Was that hanging over your head? Well, we all got threatened to be kicked out at some point. If you if you answered back to our manager about something, or I mean, I almost got kicked out because, because of the choreography. And he said, basically, and this was after about, this is before we were going to start with the small shows in clubs and things like that. Um, he said, he pulled me over and he said, look, I'm really sorry, but if you go and get your act together um, by December, and we were sort of, we were in November at that time, to do the show, to complete the moves the way they should be, he said, I'm sorry, we're going to have to let you go. So this was one of the nice threats about <laughs> kicking, but there were many more, trust me. So I got my act together. I really, really worked hard on it. He actually even gave me a mirror, one of those rehearsal mirrors that he had from an old band, because he used to have a girl band as well. And he gave me one of those mirrors. He actually had it delivered to my house and hung up on the wall by a, by a workman. So that was really nice of him. And I used that mirror, you know, for the next, well, until the end of the band, you know, to, to rehearse my moves. And uh, it, so it was um, two weeks that I had to complete this. And then when I went back, the others had already got a bit foggy about the movements and I knew every single one. I said, oh, no, 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 it's like this. And I always used to panic when they made changes. I went, oh, no, don't change it. I've just got it all down. Now are you going to change that whole part? Oh, you know, like very autistic, <laughs> which I am actually partly. Um, I was diagnosed with autism 15%. Uh, not 50, but 15, um, when I was younger. So, you know, but it, apparently it sort of uh, disintegrates as you get older, um, in, in, if you're not severe. So that was very typical, you know, of me to react that way. Tell me about those initial performances, though. How did you feel being on stage and what reaction did you get? Well, it was a very gradual um, success because we... We started with clubs and they were literally like, you know, 10 bored people there. Sometimes they, yeah, they even threw ashtrays at us and things like that. I mean, it was really, I mean, it, sometimes I did think, God, how are we ever going to make it? This is not, you know, what I had in mind. Um, but because I wasn't, we weren't professional yet. So you could tell by the way we moved, we were all a bit, you know, hadn't sort of gelled together yet. Uh, so it's because of those shows that gave us that training and to be able to have the fear of doing it in front of people, especially people who didn't like seeing you perform, who weren't interested, which is actually how you learn the best way. And then we started doing club tours. We had a huge um, amount of interest from television because we were basically a boy band. So we were invited to all these, uh, you know, events. And this is how it grew. 
And so before we knew it, we were doing these huge uh, school club tours, um, or not club tours, they were, um, sorry, that came later, school tours, and, you know, big stages and everything. And that's where it really started to feel, this is, you know, and it really started to gel together. We started to look really good on stage too. So, and then after that, it was back to, you know, clubs, but big clubs with a lot of people. By that time, we already had a following of fans. Um, we also had a, um, a regular place where we'd go every Sunday. So if we didn't have enough bookings, there was always that Sunday that we do a, a, a free performance in this club for half an hour or 40 minutes or something like that. And it was the same song as every, every, every weekend, which, uh, you know, got kind of boring. And I think the fans were going, are you going to ever do anything new? There was a new song that quite came in about every three months or so. So, and then it it sort of grew from there. And then we did our first recording um, and that got into the charts with a lot of help. Uh, we did get it played on the radio, but it didn't get very far. And then we had a second one. When you say with a lot of help, what do you mean? The management had contacts. So obviously he used his contact to uh, to get it played on the radio, which does, of course, as you know, um, declare your chart position. So, well, it helps. But, you know, the sales charts were, of course, the sales uh, charts were lousy because we only had a, you know, a handful of fans. I mean, you need, you know, a decent amount of fans to be able to get yourself into the top 10 at least, you know. So um, that took a while. But uh, we had a second song after that that flopped. We had a third one that flopped. Um, they all got played on radio because of the connections. Um, but none of them actually made it, you know, further than I think the furthest we got was about 45 in the in the Dutch charts, because this was all Netherlands based, you know, not to forget, this was all based in the Netherlands at first. And then we, uh, we moved over to Germany uh, and got into a soap called Guten Titan, Schlichter Titan, which is actually a, a Grundy um, series, soap series, which is sort of basically a copy that's made in German. And when we were in that, that's when it went bang. But not right away, you see, we were in it and we were in the first couple and nothing happened. So the, the, the song that, that was going with this package deal, we were in it for three months. And, uh, you know, they made me, I couldn't speak German at the time. And they wanted me to do the lead role. <laughs> I was like, what? I thought it, I never thought it would be me. So here I am le- learning my lines. I could have been saying I'm a in German. I wouldn't even know. And stay tuned because there's more from Benjamin Boyce in a few seconds. Just time for me to remind you once again, please subscribe to the channel. It helps me and it allows you to hear when I've posted something new on the site. Okay, let's get back to Ben. That was extremely difficult. And uh, so, but yeah, eventually, and then we all went on summer holidays or winter holidays, it was in January. And I was in the Grand Canaria and Lee was there as well with me and his girlfriend was there. And we suddenly got a call that, you know, it's entered the charts, you got to come back right away. So we were all flown back in a hurry and we didn't have anything. We didn't have any clothes for this photo session when suddenly we're on the cover of Bravo magazine and, you know, we're this, we're that, we're there, we're here. And it just suddenly exploded. And I remember looking outside the window after one of our big shows. And there were just, it was the whole street was full of people. You know, you'd, you'd look out and I threw a toilet roll out, just, you know, to, to have the effect of the, the roll going down. And, you know, to hear the scream, you know, we were calling our mum saying, listen to this, mum, I made it. <laughs> you know, and then the, putting the phone outside the window and hearing the screams every time we walked out. Did you find that easy to deal with? Because attention has two sides. I mean, the initial side, like you say, obviously it's a thrill, um, but there is always a turning point because sometimes it's very intrusive as well. So how long was it um, before you had a sort of dark side of fame experience? I think we all enjoyed it in the beginning because it came as such a surprise and it's really what we wished for. 
And I could say you could be careful what you wish for. I don't think it became a problem until later on, you know, when we got used to it. But then when it really happened that there were fans like camping outside our houses, I mean, all of us had fans, you know, it didn't take them long uh, to find out where we lived. And, you know, in Amsterdam, it, we all had apartments, you know, where you have these, well, you know what it looks like. It's, you know, just all these steps that go up these very small, long houses. So there's no real escape route. You know, you don't have back garden or something. You can go out the other way because it doesn't exist. So if you came out of your house, you know, you had to, you know, you were always, um, you know, affected by this, this sort of, you, you, you know, you'd have to leave like always a half an hour earlier or something. And that would even be difficult because you'd have to sign all these things and do pictures. And at a certain point, I put a, a note in my window that, you know, I'd, I'd really, you know, dig my privacy and, you know, I'd like it if others could too. <laughs> And that picture was in the Bravo because, you know, that was like, oh, this is the uh, the thanks they get. Oh, so it was a bit negative, but we we sorted it out. And the, the notes did remain hanging there because it just got to a point where it was just so ex extreme. And, you know, I mean, literally sleeping out somewhere. I mean, I knew all the policemen because they did some roll by. Um, and I knew their names. And I was like, hey, Hans, how you doing? You know, and a few times they'd come up uh, and say, well, there's there's a fan missing. This happened a few times. Can we search your house? And he said, if you if he said you don't have to if you don't want to. He said, but I can get a warrant within about 24 hours, and then I'll come back and do the search anyway. I said, oh no, don't worry about it. So when this happened already, by the second, I just gave him the key. I said, you can check the loft here. Go here's the key, and please lock up after you go. <laughs> so they go up. They didn't even know it was a loft. But I said, oh, yeah, there's a loft too, you know, by the first time. And, you know, I was, I, I, I thought, you know, I want to cooperate. It was just a bit annoying sometimes because they wouldn't let you know when they were coming. They'd just show up. You know, you'd have like four cops coming in your house looking, looking around. What were they know, expecting? I mean, I really want to know what they were expecting, that you'd... Well, you, you'd exactly. I mean, they didn't someone the in the basement. <laughs> I would have checked the fridge. But he didn't, <laughs> you know, like at least have a, have a little look in the fridge, you know, was, could have all been done the night before or two days before, you know, I mean, this girl had been missing for 48 hours, you know, you can, you can do a lot of chopping in 48 hours, but uh, they didn't want to see the fridge. <laughs> and I, I actually have to admit that I was a little bit, you know, afraid to make a joke about it because obviously she's missing, could have been serious. And I did think about it, but, you know, saying, do you want to look in my fridge? <laughs> but I left it. <laughs> you were riding a wave at that point, and it was really going well. So were you still very cohesive at that point? I enjoyed the, uh, you know, the screaming and the, the huge, large quantity. I mean, we've, you know, we filled arenas. Uh, at some point, you know, with 25,000 people, 30,000 people, you know, so it was that part of it was still amazing. You know, we'd have a police escort and, you know, we all had limos. By that time, we didn't want to all be together all the time. So we had our separate cars. <clears throat> um, we were flown in by a, a private plane uh, to go to places. We didn't even travel uh, the, you know, the airlines anymore because it took too long. So we just had a small plane and we'd go from... I mean, if it was in reasonable distance, obviously, if it was all the way in Asia or something, we'd still be doing the, uh, you know, the airlines. But um, I, 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 I always enjoyed it, actually, up until the end. Although I did see cracks forming in the end, you know, that, that we didn't have these 25,000 people anymore. It was already sort of getting almost half. And this is before anyone else noticed but we were doing smaller stadiums. I mean, this is, you know, the fourth, fifth time round, you know, and then not many, as many tickets. And I think all boy bands come to a point where it becomes, you know, the flair, because kids who like you, they grow up so fast in two or three years, and then they go, oh no, that's for, that's for, that's for little kids. So they, they tend to move on. And uh, I could see that happening and, I think at the time, you know, I knew because I had an offer from um, from Sony Epic Music 
and Andy and I, and they both wanted me. And I thought, I have to do this while the, you know, strike while the iron's hot, because this offer might not be there in a year, you know, because if I can already see the cracks forming, um, then, you know, they will too soon. And I thought we have to go out with, you know, while it's still hot and not when it's run out. And uh, so that, that was basically all what we always said. But of course, by that time, I think everybody got a bit scared of the word breaking up and it did form a bit of a bit of grief. Well, tell me in what way, because did you actually, had you to told the guys that you were thinking of doing your own album? Um, well, I waited until I'd got everything sorted out with, with, the, with this music lawyer I had actually was based in Cologne. Um, so I, I got a letter from him to give to my uh, manager and I hand delivered the letter, just like in a movie. This is for you. So what do you do? You grab the letter. So it was given to him. And, well, he read it. He wasn't happy about it. But he kind of acted around it like he didn't take me seriously. And that, that was kind of frustrating. I said, well, you do realize that, you know. He said, yeah, yeah, I read, I read the letter. So, so you want to leave? Why would you want to do that? I said, well. I said, not right away. I'll wait till the tour comes to an end. This is this final tour. And, you know, if you want to continue without me or, you know, get someone else, whatever. So this was actually the plan that he wanted to get a, a, a replacement for me. And this is, was a, objected against from the other guys. They didn't, uh, they didn't agree with that at all. So the manager basically at a certain point got pissed off with all of us. And he pulled the plug. He just cancelled the last tour. So I didn't even have to go on for the last six months, which was horrible for me because my manager wasn't talking to me. He was actually even not letting me know the schedule so that he could make problems for me if I didn't show up. Do you understand what I mean? Then he could, he could, he could sue me for not showing up. So he did this on purpose. So I had to find out through Lee. Sorry, that was the cat. <laughs> I had to find out through Lee Busty and Eloy what the schedule was. And we weren't on best terms either because they were a little bit pissed that I was leaving at first. And so, you know, it was, it was a difficult time. So I, anyway, I had to find out all these schedules through him. So I was, I was very relieved when this finally actually came to an end. And we did the last show as a surprise, which wasn't planned as the last show, but it was just the last show that we were doing on the list. So that's how it happened. That was in Magdeburg in, in Germany. Was there a particular moment where you sort of all said to each other, well, that's it? Like, and how did that feel for each of you, do you feel? I'm trying to remember. I do remember feeling very strange about the fact, you know, when we've done this show, this will be the last time that we do a show. And it was, you know, it, so it just didn't really kick in. It didn't seem real. So we, after that, we came off stage, we went back to the hotel, everyone was a bit upset, everybody got drunk, but we weren't together. We were all in our rooms and, you know, making phone calls or whatever. And we went back the next day. And I remember there were some problems at the airport, there was a delay of the flight and everything. And everybody was quite normal, nobody was talking about it. And we were just, we want to get home, you know, this delay, oh God, you know, so on that day it was, it was horrible. And then the, the, the one of the um, security guys got into a fight with someone at the airport for some reason. I, I can't even remember why. So then he was being investigated by the police. So that was another holdup. So, and that was, and we just, we just got on our flight. And that was also the last time I saw him. So... It was all a bit strange on that day, but it wasn't like we were all, we didn't really talk about it much. We did a farewell interview for um, Bravo Magazine and Bravo TV and ugh, God knows all the others. And I think we, we, we did that in the space of about two days. Um, and then we got an offer from our record company to do a final album. <clears throat> And they wanted me because nobody, everybody said, nah, it's over. We don't want to do it. And I remember I was contacted and they said, would you be able to convince the guys? And of course there was, you know, there was a handsome fee involved for everyone, every individual. So <clears throat> I talked them into it. And I said, look, we don't even have to do this together. 
everybody does their own songs. So we each did three songs and there was just one oldie of the one that we did together, which hadn't been released yet. And that was all piled on an album. So I did three songs, everybody did three songs and that's how we made the final album. And uh, it all sounded very different. You know, everybody did their own theme and you could tell that it was all very different producers and one was better than the other, um, you know, quality wise. But uh, we weren't there to promote the album. It didn't sell tremendously well. It would still be very high figures for today's scale. But um, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't, um, I think, worth, they didn't recoup it, you know, I don't think. Did the fans blame you for the end of the band? Because, you know, fans can be really, you know, sensitive at this point because they love the band. And whoever breaks it up is sort of the enemy at that point. I just wondered if you were to blame in their eyes. Uh, yes, some of them were a little bit. I was trying, you see, when I came out, not right away, because you didn't have internet and all that kind of thing, so there was no way you knew exactly what was going on. But when I started my solo career, which was very soon after, um, I remember there were some signs in, in the crowd, you know, you you asshole for leaving Court in the Act, or, you know, Robbie Williams wannabe... Uh, things like that, you know, you're just like Robbie Williams, he's an arsehole too, uh, leaving the band. Um, so I didn't, I didn't go against it. I did say, you know, I just said, well, you know, that's just the way it is. I mean, we'd be doing this for six and a half years, nearly seven years, if you uh, include the very last album and the promotion around it, which wasn't much. It was about seven years we were together. And I thought, you know, you, you can't be in a boy band forever, at least, you know, other boy bands have proved you can and they have comebacks, but you know, that for me it was enough. And I'd, you know, I had, I had new dreams and I, I knew I had to do this because I was being offered this deal with Sony, which was amazing. I mean, it was such a good deal. Um, <clears throat> so when I actually came out with my solo stuff, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't as nearly as successful as Corny Act was. Once again, the figures that I had, in today's figures would still be very good. But of course, this was when the, the music, um, you know, uh, industry was changing very rapidly. You already had these, you know, when you burnt CDs and everything, and that's what everybody was doing. That's how people shared music. So not everybody was buying the albums anymore. And I think at that time, I, I sold around 60,000 copies in, in the first, I don't know, was it this is the first period, which was probably around two months or so. So for today's sales, that would have been pretty good still, you know, but back then it was the considered, because they were hoping, of course, um, that it was going to sell like Courtney Axe sold, you know. I mean, I knew you at that period and you were, you were, I remember you being very excited at that period. It was like, it, it was really like, okay, you'd broken free and you had a new life. And you were very excited about your own work and what you were right. doing. Um, right. Was it was it this new life for you at that point? Well, I think from for all from from you know from mistakes and from from things that don't happen the way you planned it. That's what you learn the most, actually, isn't it? Really, about your situation. Um, I got an extreme kick out of writing my own album. I mean, I wrote nearly all the songs myself, except from one. Um, most of the music, so basically just the melodies, all the production and everything else, that was done by producers because I wasn't that far yet. And uh, so I got an extreme kick out of doing that. And so, and I think I just wasn't quite ready to be a solo star. You know, it was very different to be on stage all by myself. And if I look at old videos, I look a bit lost. And I wouldn't hear it back then, but I remember actually my record company saying, yeah, you need a band on stage or something. It looks like you're, you feel a, a bit lost because you're used to, and I just wouldn't admit it. You know, I just wouldn't have it. But if I look at old videos now, I would admit that actually that was the case. And I think I looked insecure because I think I was really trying to break away from this boy band image. And I, you know, I shaved my head. I'd do anything to basically say, look, I'm different. I'm not this boy band. And then I, I later realized you can't wash it off. You are labeled, that's what you're famous for. You are labeled with that for life, even now, even what I was doing in the end before I stopped doing music. It was like, 
you know, and, and I learned and learned. And I just went up back to basically being partly this, this boy band guy, especially with the fans and everything, because that was how they knew me. And um, I had a, you know, I had this, this, this thing about love songs as well, you know, the word love in every single song, which is like, so I wanted to, I wanted to do an album with the least amount of love in it. And, um, you know, more about just, just other things other than that. Um, but, you know, that could also be a reason that the, you know, that, that sort of nice, slimy guy wasn't there anymore, you know? Well, you were more the uh, rebel then, weren't you? You were like, I, I mean, was really, I, I, yeah. you know, yeah. you were a bit of a rebel at that time. I'm I was, not saying I wasn't either, but you certainly were as well. Yeah, you were too, definitely. <laughs> I, know what, I know what we got up to a few times. <laughs> we'll leave that for, for part two. <laughs> okay. But it was an interesting period, I feel, because for you, you had become a celebrity in Germany. You know, you, you were very well known. You had a high profile relationship with Alexandra Bettel, who was right. a presenter on the music channel Viva in Germany. Um, right. And so you were always in the press. I mean, not, you know, the court and the act days were over, but you were still always uh, yeah. in the no. press. Yes, Sorry. I was actually quite against doing this, this couple thing for press. I turned a lot of things down because I didn't want it to be about that. You know, I want it to, to be about me and the music. Um, so I did turn a lot of things down. But, you know, a fact is fact. If you're with someone who's also famous, then obviously you're going to be written about more anyway. So, <clears throat> you know. But it was, I mean, I, it was quite intrusive for you at that period. I mean, you were very well known. And, um, and I've had this as well, where had a lot of success. And then when the success has gone, you're still well known, but the success isn't there. And it's quite, yeah. tough to deal with how did you deal with that how did you feel about that um well i will admit that after the boy band i didn't have any uh regrets or missed anything about it except for maybe a, uh, a few personal things maybe um but i think when i i think this was maybe about two years after my my solo stuff i could see that it had just i needed to take a break because everything had been done. Um, and that's what, you know, as an artist, you need to do that sometimes, you know, you need to take a break and then figure it out in a few years. So I really did. I took a, I took a few years off. I went to Ibiza for a while. I lived there for a year. When fame subsides, right, it can, right. it can be quite there, difficult. There were definitely some depressing times and, you know, why can't I make it is why didn't my dreams work out or even just half work out? Uh, because there were some very, um, and I think any artist could agree with me, there are some very unsuc unsuccessful years that come with successful years, you know, or after. And it's pretty normal, uh, but you don't see it that way. You take it very personally, and um, I did, and I'll admit that, definitely. Um, so, but, you know, I, at a certain point, I think I just pulled myself together and found a new way of, which was a new way of de dealing with it, and that was just basically doing all the shows I could on a booking um, level. And that I, I just kept on doing that for, I don't know, let's see if, well, after the band broke up. So we were in, this is two, ever since 2001. And that's what I've been aiming to doing. And then I did this comeback show, which was in 2004, which was a good promotion, which uh, I came second after Chris Norman, whether that's a compliment or not, I don't know, but. <laughs> Um, but that certainly, you know, that certainly helped the promotion to, to, to get these show bookings that I was, I was interested in. And that's what I did ever since. It was a combination between sort of reality shows and doing these bookings. You said to me once, which I don't know why this stuck with me, but you said to me once that these bookings are moving further and further east. <laughs> it's like, a, and you said something like, I'm going to end up, you didn't say this, but I'm going to end up in Siberia. Do you know what I mean? It's like you, you. You also, you knew where it was going. That's what my feeling is today. You knew where it was going, but you had to keep going on this journey with it at that time. So it wasn't, there wasn't a moment in that time where you could make a decision, 
I don't want this anymore. You were still doing it. Uh, no, that came much later. I, I do actually, I think it was Lou Reed who said he, he made a deal at the crossroads to never stop doing music once he'd been successful with it. And I, I remember him saying that and uh, in an interview or something I saw from probably years before. And I thought, yeah, that's the same with me. You know, once you've made your, this pact with yourself that you're going to do music for the rest of your life, you know, I wanted to die on stage, basically. Um, so that's that's what I was determined to do. And, um, you know, I just saw it disintegrating. And I think for me, when the when the final end came, you know, after all these years, um, up up and down like a roller coaster, basically, with the success, um, it never hit as big as it ever was in Courtney Act. <clears throat> but there were moments that you could sort of compare it with. <clears throat> but, you know, then again, the whole industry has changed. Music industry has changed anyway. Uh, but I think when COVID actually came, hit, and I was being controlled by the government to not go on stage, I think that was the final decision for me. I just can't deal with this anymore. The guys got back together, didn't they? And they did their own tour. How did you feel when that happened, when Court in the Act sort of reappeared on stage? We started talking about doing a, a comeback. <clears throat> I mean, this, is, this has come up so many times over the years, even after, ever since, it, you know, like after, I think it was about 10 years or so. And it wasn't until 20 years after that everybody sort of said, all right, let's, uh, let's talk about it. So the idea behind it for me was that we don't go back to doing exactly the same thing, uh, that we didn't do this full boy band routine and, you know, the way everything looked. You know, we all had beer bellies by then, you know, by now, let's say. So I, didn't, I just didn't really see how that could work. Uh, so we, we decided that we were going to just do spacing on stage and just keep it, you know, and... and I wanted to concentrate more on the harmonies and, you know, be a solid harmony band and, you know, um, use any, any talent that we had, you know, to, to use that on stage as a, as a really good musical band. But that idea sort of drifted off. And before I knew it, um, everyone had already agreed to do a tour with stadiums. And I said, that's not going to work. Don't do it. You know, you can't, disappear for 20 years and then suddenly do stadiums. I said, without any form of hardcore promotion <clears throat> for about a year, you should give it about a year before you do the stadiums. I just didn't feel that it was going to, to work. And I said, you won't get more people than I feel lucky. I said about 2,500. And everyone was like, nah, why would you say that? I said, because I've been doing this for a long time and I know that, you know, I just know that the, the, the quantity, I could feel it. So, when they decided to, to sort of do this full routine and, you know, um, do the stadium tour, I felt I have no control over anything that gets said um, because it was probably three against one, I guess. So I pulled out. I just said, you know, I don't think this is a good idea. And the, I, I was more into doing a club tour and having them banging on the doors, you know, to get in instead of having empty spaces in a stadium, you know, which, which looked a little empty in some of the shots that I saw. Um, <clears throat> not saying that uh, they didn't do a good job, because they did. Uh, but I think in the press wrote that I, I just didn't feel like it, which is not true. I mean, I, I didn't just say I don't feel like it. It was more to it than that. And I mean, and then a later point, uh, very soon after this tour, um, Bastian took over the management for the whole band. And I think for me, that wouldn't have worked out. You know, I'm sure he'd, he'd be a very good manager, but he's not going to be my manager. <laughs> you know, I figured so. I figured I can't be in a situation where somebody's telling me what to do uh, anymore. And I can't be in a band where somebody that I used to work with as an equal is now going to be telling me basically what's what there was one story in the press and it was after ich bin ein star hoping here else the i'm a celebrity version in germany that you're on right and you were accused of hitting your girlfriend and i just wondered because i know you well and i just wondered how that um story 
impacted you and what the truth is of that? Well, the truth is, is we had a fight. We, we, we um, agreed afterwards. I mean, already before when we went into that show, when I went into that show, we, we, I'd already said that my, the girlfriend, the current girlfriend I had, she doesn't want to be on cam. She doesn't want to do interviews. She was that type of person, just likes to stay behind things and not a front person at all. So we, we, we had a fight that evening. It was, you know, just over nothing, really. And so then the press, of course, always wanted to get into, you know, what, what, what happened. We didn't really give them much, except from what they could guess. But what the story, what they wrote, wasn't true. And I did give a statement, actually, a few times. I gave one to, to Bill Siding. And I, a few years later, I actually gave one to RTL. But... I even said then too, I don't want to get into it. I'm not, I, I never get into personal details of my relationships, you know? And I, I don't think it's fair talking about ex-girlfriends or, you know, this or that. So there's not really much to say about it. I think, um, you know, it wasn't true what they wrote. And I think, you know, the people that know me, you know, they know how it is. I mean, as we started this interview, there you are in Florida, <laughs> in this right. very nice house obviously um you've got all your um sales records gold records yes. or platinum yes. records yeah, or whatever they are. they are behind you everything yeah. the memories of the past and everything it was difficult you, to you... get them in a square you know what i mean it took a lot of figuring out i did that on the bed i just placed them on the bed which is almost as big as this wall and then i figured out how i can get them fit them in a square you see that so they're all equal so how did you end up in Florida and what difference has this made to your life? Well, I, I, I met um, I met this terrific woman in uh, 2021 um, in Germany. Uh, it was a very brief moment and we actually did the rest on, on Instagram. Just chatting. You know, we, we hadn't really made any plans or anything when, when we'd met the first time. It was a very brief moment, uh, which was in Cologne while she was visiting... Um, somebody in um, Germany at the time. And one of her friends lives in Cologne. So I just met her very briefly and we kept in touch and fell in love and, uh, you know, decided at some point, this was in 22. So yeah, 19, uh, 2022, we decided to, you know, do all this. And, uh, you know, I'm glad I did. It was, it was I mean, it was, very radical change coming up. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing. You, you just give up your whole life in order to start a new one. And I, I, you know, I sold everything and threw so many things away. And it's just, at a certain point, I just didn't know what to do with it anymore because some of the things were too good to be thrown away and they wouldn't sell. So, and it wasn't really to make money. It was just to, you know, what am I going to do with all this stuff? And I have a friend in, 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 um, um, somewhere in Germany, Ludwigshagen, I think it is. And she's got all my stuff still stashed away in her basement, what was left of it. So, yeah, it was just an incredible change. So I had all these, these shipped over without the frames and everything, without the glass. I took them all off and bundled them up in just with the cardboard backings and the CDs in it. It was very difficult because I had to make sure it was protected. And I had that sent over, but I have hardly anything. I just had two suitcases, and that was sent over later. I don't know exactly what you're doing there, but maybe you can tell me. And also, what you're, you know, have you got any specific goals? What What do you want to do while you're there? Well, um, I think I've really. I wouldn't say. I mean, you never say never when it comes to music, because obviously, I know about music. I've I learned how to sing very well at a certain point, so I still have that ambition to maybe sing again on stage, but. I don't know how that's going to happen. I mean, no one knows me here. We were never famous here. So I think the music chapter is just closed for now. Um, maybe forever, maybe not. I'm not sure. Um, I'm actually really trying to get into a job where it's furnishing. So, you know, refurnishing furniture. So antiques, you know, damaged antiques or something, and then trying to get the, you know, perfectly fixed to refurnish things so and i'd love to do that job and something that's always interested me because i'm i'm good at doing stuff like that you know like camouflaging <clears throat> mistakes in broken furniture and things like that so that's basically what i really want to get into but it's not as easy as i had hoped for 
Um, so that's what I'm working on right now. Tell me, what would happen if, you know, Bastian, Eloy, Lee got in touch and said, hey, we want to go back to the original formation. We want to go on tour. We want to do it your way. Okay. What would you say? Oh, well, um, I think it would be have to be very sort of well planned also financially because I'm all the way here. So that's in the mix. If we, <laughs> if we leave all that out and let's say they want to do a TV show with the original members and it's tied together with a song and a few shows or something. Yeah, I'd love to. It'd be great. You know, um, and I think also because, um, you know, we, we, with the the terms I left the guys on wasn't really bad, but it could have been better. And we're not in contact anymore. So it's gone back to the old way it was for the 20 years before that, which is a bit of a shame. Um, I do have contact with one. And I actually stayed very loyal also as a friend, and that's Lee. You know, he's great. And um, I hear from him a lot. And we like each other on Instagram and things like that, like each other's pictures and stuff like that. So that's nice to have at least contact with one of them still from a memory, which is obviously a very, very special memory. You know, you've got your old fans. They want the real thing. I mean, they would do anything to see us on stage again, you know, with the four of us. So anyway, to, yeah, to come back to your question, I would definitely, definitely say yes. But I don't, don't know if that's going to happen. OK, Ben, I mean, honestly, I was thrilled that we're back in touch. And I'm especially thrilled that you're doing so well and that you're happy in your new life in florida so thank you very much benjamin boy hey thank you thanks thanks steve it was great to see you as well and uh i hope i'll see you again sometime i mean i'll be passing by cologne probably when i come back if you're still there that's it but then... no watermelons yeah. and i'm not going to say why but no watermelons <laughs> oh you saw that in the, in the yes right i did see that and i totally forgotten about it but i suddenly remembered <laughs> um, okay well. up there is an interview i recommend down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews and here is where you can connect.